thank you so much for coming in. Uh, I'm Vivian Chavez and I work for Eventbrite. I am the community marketing manager as well as sort of an in-house virtual events expert. I also have been an event creator my whole life and uh, do this outside of work as well. So events are just my life and I'm really happy to share space with other creators uh, as we figure out this brave new world of online events. Um, before we get started, we have a, a couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is gonna go on for about an hour total. Um, we'll have roughly 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, and speaking of Q&A, we really appreciate everyone who submitted questions before the webinar. We received a lot of great questions. And as I mentioned a minute ago, we have a really packed house today, so we won't be opening up the Q&A tool um, since sometimes questions can get lost in the shuffle, um, but we will try to address all the questions that we can. And we'll also be sending a follow-up email um, where we try to tackle anything that might come in after that we don't address live. You'll get an uh, uh, email with a recap of this, as well as a link if you wanna watch it back in case you dial in late and missed anything and a survey for feedback. So if you like the webinar and you want more webinars on a different topic, let me know. Um, and also if you have any feedback about how we could have made it more useful, we love that stuff. So please let us know. And lastly, uh, given shelter in place orders, I just wanted to mention that I'm currently working from home. Um, you might hear cats and or kids in the background. And uh, the other panelist is on uh, working from home as well. So bear with us if we run into any technical issues or uncooperative internet connections along the way. Uh, I'm sure you all are all familiar with those exciting moments in your online events. So. Here's who we have today. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Vivian and I, I work for Eventbrite. And then I'm also so thrilled to be joined by uh, Jacqueline Rosenberg, who's on the call as well. She is the founder of this incredible collective called Society X that hosts um, just hundreds of events and has a really great unique perspective because she oversees a broad list of creators doing different types of events on how they've handled pricing and has some really great insights there. So we will be um, pulling her in for a little discussion time towards about the halfway mark. Okay, without further ado, we're gonna dive in. Here's what we're gonna cover today. Um, we'll be talking through some industry insights. We are you know, lucky at Eventbrite to have a really broad view of what's happening out in the industry. And we have um, some cool data that might help you ground um, your approach to online events in some of this information. We'll also be doing a little product pro tips. Uh, I know some people on the call are old hands at Eventbrite and know it in and out. Uh, and then some people are brand new. So we'll try to make sure that we touch on things that are useful for everyone. Uh, and then we will be doing our live discussion with our event creator, Jack. And at the end, we will have some time for Q&A. All right. All right. Kicking it off with, um, I'm a huge event data nerd, so I love this stuff. And we're going to uh, give you a little slice of some industry insights that we have seen. So right now we are almost eight months into the COVID-19 global pandemic and two things are pretty clear to us. Our desire for human connection remains strong um, and the future of events is probably gonna be hybrid. And in fact, according to a recent study we commissioned, 57% of respondents are open to continuing to attend virtual events even after social distancing restrictions have been lifted. Uh, additionally, we, we found some, some cool stats which are that 62 percent of the respondents in the study that we commissioned have attended five or more online events in a recent in the recent month. 42 percent of the respondents have paid between $11 and $30 to attend virtual events. So attendees out there out, out there are paying for virtual events. Uh, and then lastly, nearly half invited others to join them virtually for the online event. So we're still seeing the phenomenon of people, uh, the go-getters who find the cool events and tell their friends about them and bring them along. So there, there are threads of what we were seeing in a pre-online and pre-COVID world um, still happening today, which is really exciting. I think it validates the fact that those of you that are um, continuing to push forward and figure out how to gather your communities online, you are fulfilling a need for your uh, consumers. And a little bit more data insight here. Virtual events are not only helping us feel connected through the pandemic, they're creating relevance for audiences beyond the boundaries of in-person events and giving creators all types of additional avenues um, or continued revenue. The Eventbrite survey results showed us that attendees are crossing, crossing 
digital geographical borders. Uh, so what that means is that 65 respondents are attending events outside of their state, 62 are attending events outside of their city, and 28% are attending events outside of their country. What's exciting to me about this information is that while it can feel hard that we can't gather in the same way that we were, um, we're actually we have a huge opportunity to broaden our audiences. So not only can people who wouldn't have been able to attend our events due to their schedule or, you know, whatever was happening in their life, um, now you can have someone who could never have attended because they're in a foreign country dialing in and becoming an avid fan of your work. And we're also seeing that um, folks who had limitations, uh, you know, with physical abilities or you know, reasons why they couldn't leave their homes um, are now, you know, the gates have been open to them to, be, to participate as well. So there's an opportunity to actually really grow the audience. And then we jump into pricing. Um, so what we just looked at before was sort of the overall uh, insights on who's attending events and how many people and the news is good you know people want to continue to gather they're still interested they're looking for things to do and online is working um, and in that slide before we mentioned that you know most people pay between 11 and 30 dollars uh, but you know not every event is apples to apples. There's a lot of different types of events, there's different categories, there's different purposes. And so we did a little bit more of a deep dive into some of the pricing averages that uh, we're seeing across the board. So if we look into uh, averages for this is online tickets specifically, we're seeing a range from category to category. Online music events um, average about $17. Food and drink events come in at about 34. And then health and wellness is clocking in at about $29. Some of the priciest tickets um, that we're seeing are that science and technology events actually average $87 a ticket and business and professional tickets are costing around $91. So you can start to think about the fact that it's not simply um, a one size fits all experience where you should just put up any old event for $10. You can really start to think about the experience that you're offering, the category that you're in, and then what you're seeing around you in the broader industry landscape uh, for what people are charging. And this can start to help inform um, the way that you price your, your event. Uh, stats are one thing and industry insight is great, but I think uh, one thing that's been really inspiring is seeing uh, creators across the board start to connect with each other and learn from each other because we're all figuring this out as we go. And um, it's, you know, some people have been pushing really hard, you know, March since day one. Other people are right now just starting to figure out online events. And we are lucky enough to get to talk to creators um, all the time. And so we have a couple of little snapshots of what other creators are doing uh, to uh, value their businesses and encourage en attendees to purchase tickets to their events. So first up, we spoke with Vito um, from TOF Productions, which is an interactive virtual music nightclub. They charge about $10 for GA and $20 for VIP meet and greet. And they reached out to their audiences, members and colleagues to determine what they charge. You don't always really have to just guess on your own. Um, you can talk to the people in your community. They didn't want people with financial limitations to feel like they couldn't participate. And they wanted to make sure that artists were feeling compensated. So I think the key takeaway there from our conversation with Vito is that, you know, connect with your community. Don't be afraid to reach out directly and figure out what people can and are willing to pay. A little bit of lightweight research can help you feel confident about going to market with the right price point for your event and your community. Uh, next up, we talked to Evan Weiss, who hosts an annual cocktail and food tasting event called the Bloody Mary Festival. Uh, which was a running event before COVID and their normal in-person festival um, last year cost around $50 for general admission and attendees would get two and a half hour samplings of Bloody Marys from 10 to 15 different vendors. When they were determining what to charge for their virtual festival this year, they felt that they could they really found a way to capture the essence of the festival and they're still delivering five cocktails in a 90 minute virtual setting. So they felt that um, this price point of $75 really represented the value that they were bringing to attendees. And the key takeaway here is that a high quality virtual experience has real value. I think a lot of creators are feeling hesitant to uh, charge for their events because um, attendees are still 
like showing their interest in the online version of what they're doing. But don't forget that what you're doing um, is really important and they're getting a lot out of it and that you can craft the event in a way that feels like you're delivering high value and you can confidently go to your market with a higher price point. Uh, and our final creator um, little story is that Adriana heads up Girls in Tech, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that hosts a variety of events and programs uh, that focuses on supporting women in their careers in the STEM fields. And her advice to other creators was just don't overthink it. You won't know what works until you try it. And that includes pricing. Uh, you know, I, I really love this, this advice. And she also said something else when we were talking to her that for them, COVID has been a little bit of a blessing in disguise um, from a business learnings perspective because the silver lining is that it helped them change their whole business model overnight to digital and they're realizing that it's a smart business move for them. They've been able to produce uh, more and reach a lot more people globally through digital programming. And for them, they've also found that it's less expensive overall to produce so they have less overhead. And I think you know the, the key takeaway here is don't be afraid to experiment. It might take you a few tries to figure out what feels best when you're switching to online events and uh, figure out what you're charging. And that's not only okay, it's actually gonna help you learn a lot about your business, about your community, uh, and about uh, what, kind of, what kind of business model you wanna use going forward. That was our um, creator insight story. And I do wanna give a little plug for our blog. Um, you can find more about these specific creators as well as a ton of others uh, and information on hosting better live streams, our marketing guide, free templates and more on the Eventbrite blog. Uh, it's a really fantastic place. And um, some of the stats and some of the creator stories that we pulled have um, even more info there. So if you're curious, please go ahead and type that into your URL and check it out. All right, we are gonna dive right into our product pro tips. So just uh, use the raise your hand feature if you have been on Eventbrite for more than a year. All right, we got a lot of, nice. We have a lot of people who've been here for a while. All right, once I see those stop showing up on the screen. Okay, now raise your hand on the Zoom feature if you are brand new and you've joined within the last month or two. Oh, this is so great. Okay, cool. So we have a lot of people from both camps. Um, we're going to touch on some things that uh, might be old news for some of you and uh, hopefully a couple of um, little deeper dives that are going to be valuable. I'm going to drink some water. So when you're thinking about pricing your online event, obviously one of the first things that you're going to want to think about are your tickets. Uh, so the first product uh, area that I'll show you is how to add them. Um, again, this might be old news for some of my older friends here, um, but what we're looking at is the screen that shows where to add tickets when you're creating a new event. The tickets option is on the left-hand side in the menu bar, and then there's an orange button called Create Ticket. Once you click that, you'll see this little menu on the right-hand side where you can add a free ticket, a paid ticket, or a donation, and there's a lot of settings that you can get more specific about what you're offering down below below, but I'm just going to go ahead and focus on these three main categories and talk about some of the benefits of each one. All of these different ticket types can be useful and it really depends on the kind of event that you're hosting and what you're trying to achieve. Um, a paid ticket is obviously going to help you generate funds and we see that when an attendee pays for an event, they're much more likely to actually show up. And on the flip side, a free registration can also be really powerful. A lot of our creators see their highest RSVPs when they list a free registration option. Uh, although as many of you have probably experienced with free registrations, often the show rate is only you know, between 40 and 60%. So you're not getting a ton of people uh, who registered actually showing up and tuning in. But despite that fact, um, using the free option can make sure that your event is accessible to those without funds and it helps you build an audience of engaged consumers. So even if folks register and they don't actually dial in, you can retarget people who signed up for your events by using Eventbrite's email invitation and email campaign feature. And you can start to build that community and that email list of engaged consumers out there. So having a 40% show rate is normal and you can still continue to talking, talking to the people who didn't show up. They are interested in what you're doing and who knows, you know, 
life gets in the way for tuning into online events. I certainly have experienced that. I want to do a 7 p.m. event and all of a sudden my three-year-old has a meltdown and I have to hopefully um, pray that the creator sends out a recording of it later. And then finally, I wanted to call out the donation ticket. This is a great way to have a pay what you can ticket or drive donations to your organization or a charity that you support. And um, if you didn't know, there's actually no Eventbrite fees on the donation option. None passed on to you and none passed on to your attendee. There's the normal credit card processing fee, um, but it will be a lot more of a charitable option. And we're also seeing a lot of people use this uh, as like a sliding scale ticket, because again, it's a strange economic time for a lot of our attendees and having variable pricing can be really helpful. All right, fab. We're going to slide into another product area uh, that I think is a little underused, but we're starting to see a lot of exciting um, innovation for how people are using this particular feature, and that's the add-on feature. When you click add tickets, you'll see in this middle menu, um, there's admissions and then add-ons right next to that. Uh, I highly suggest you consider using this when you're hosting your online events. We've seen a lot of creators successfully drive revenue with the, with the add-on feature by giving attendees the option to buy additional items. Some creators, like the Bloody Mary Festival, are hosting craft or food tasting events and actually mailing out materials in advance to their attendees so they have a tangible thing to interact with during the event itself. Um, others are using it to sell merch like shirts uh, or books. We have a lot of bookstores who are hosting online book talks and they will use the add-on feature um, to drive sales for the book that they're talking about. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of old venues or organizations that primarily hosted in-person events that are not able to right now use this feature to um, sell old inventory to previous shows or old show posters. And this not only allows them to clear out their warehouse, which is obviously a good feeling, but it's generating extra funds for them without them having to produce a new item. And it's giving their community a way to support the venue and get a hold of something tangible that, that helps them feel connected to these places. Um, so definitely think about the add-on feature. You can get really creative with it. We're also seeing people use it for non-physical items like a you can add on if you want to uh, provide a recording of the class to folks who want to keep it on their computers, if it's, you know, maybe a seminar or an educational experience, you can do an add on for that for $5. A lot of ways to get creative with this. And then finally, um, this is probably one of my personal favorite areas of the product, and that is the analyze section. So once you start hosting online events and experiment with different pricing options, you can check out um, you know, I'm a huge, again, data nerd. You can just check out this section for some charts and reporting. What we're looking at in this specific snapshot is uh, one of our creators event data that's looking at all the events that they've hosted and groups their sales by ticket type to see which tickets are selling the best. So this particular view can help you see which price points are most appealing to your attendees. Uh, and then you can also dive into a ton of other reports that give you insight into um, how are your email campaigns doing? How's your sales traffic doing? Uh, what activities are you doing that are working and reaching your audiences? And then what activities aren't working that you could potentially scale back on? There's a ton of great information on the Help Center about diving into some of these specific reports if you wanna do a deep dive on it. Um, but I, I really think once you get in there and you start realizing you can do cross event reports, you can't. it's not just a report looking at one event, you can analyze what's happening across the board. Um, you're gonna unlock a lot of learning for yourself uh, especially as you are experimenting with prices and different aspects of this uh, new online event universe. My last uh, product pro tip is that I wanted to give a quick plug for the organizer app. Um, use the raise your hand feature if you already have the organizer app. You got a, yeah, nice. I love this app. Um, you know, we all are spending a lot of time scrolling on our phones and for the, it's oftentimes doom scrolling, and I think is the term where you're just looking at the news and, and feeling a sense of doom. Um, but what you could do instead is download the organizer app and use it to check out all of the sales and registrations for your online events. Um, it also gives you a way to scaf safely scan and sell tickets. If you are starting to enter into a socially distant in-person event, uh, you, this is a great option where there has to be no contact, no handing pieces of paper back and forth. It's free in the Android and the Apple app store. Um, and you just 
just log into the same account that you use for Eventbrite and it will automatically pull in all of your event data. Uh, and oh my gosh, I love it. It's so fun. All right, we are gonna dive into, I know I saw a couple of questions pop up, so we'll try to uh, grab those when we get to the Q&A, um, but we're gonna dive into our featured creator and do some Q&A. Uh, I am so excited to introduce Jacqueline and I mentioned her at the beginning of the call, but just I wanted to really quickly set the stage and let you know uh, who Jacqueline is and what Society X is. So Society X is this really uh, exciting group that um, hosts their events on Eventbrite and they are a live interactive experience marketplace that allows creatives to monetize their passion. Their mission is to support creatives and connect communities through virtual experiences worldwide by broadening access to fulfilling a fulfilling purposeful livelihood and the uh, incredible genius behind this project is a woman that I adore located in New York named Jacqueline Rosenberg. So Jacqueline, um, will you, I'm going to go ahead and oh, actually we have a few more slides so I won't stop presenting, but I will go ahead and hand the virtual mic over to yourself to talk a little bit about your background as a creator and Society X. Great, thank you so much. And just want to say just the background is we've never physically met but during covid we connected um and you guys found us society x and i'm super thankful for that uh it's been a whirlwind um just to give you guys a little bit of a background i've had my own real estate company here in new york for a decade it sounds crazy <laughs> working with celebrities and athletes uh mostly in the new york tri-state area and about two years ago, I transitioned over to hosting events with these celebrities and athletes and kind of connecting my communities in that capacity. We ended up working at Art Basel um, and hosted an incredible event, ended up selling all the artwork there. And I realized I needed to segment my real estate company from this events company. So I wasn't sure where it was going to go or how it was going to work out. Um, I ended up realizing I was going to open up a specifically geared to creators, co-working space, uh, was working in Newark, New Jersey and Edgewater. And then I decided I had to figure out how to prove to investors that this was a great concept. So we opened up in bars, nightclubs and lounges here in New York uh, in January of 2020 <laughs> uh, in about 12 different locations. Uh, it was $100 a month to have membership. You could access all the locations uh, and then COVID hit. So. Some of our events looked like this, by the way, <laughs> um, bringing us back to the physical space. Um, so yeah, so we transitioned to being completely digital on a whim. Uh, I realized quickly that, you know, we were going to actually be shut down for quite some time. Um, had reached out to some of the people that were members to ask if they would be interested in hosting some classes. What did they do? Uh, so we actually started off with Christina Adams and Ariel. Uh, as some of our first hosts who were Society X members in the physical space. Um, and then it kind of trickled down from there. Uh, it was word of mouth. Someone knew someone else that would be great at hosting another class, so on and so forth. So now we're eight months in and we host everything from fitness classes to wellness, to parent virtual learning courses, uh, to educational courses as well. So it's a, it's a vast array and, and we're growing quickly. Um, and building our platform as well. So thankful to, uh, to have connected with Eventbrite and have the opportunity to work together to kind of execute this organic, um, unique following that we have, especially with our creators. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's the spiel <laughs> as of now. I love it. And yeah, you, you managed to sneak in a few of the things there about what things looked like before COVID and then how you pivoted to online events. Um, and to kind of click a little bit deeper into what events look like now, I grabbed this screenshot because I'm, I'm a personal attendee of Society X. I love Jocelyn's class about houseplants. You can see uh, I have houseplants all over the place. Um, but tell us a little bit about you know, pricing aside, what do the actual events look like right now? I know you have a lot of different creators and different types of events, but if you were to sum it up, um, how are you going about things? Yeah, well, number one, I think the, the biggest question right now with, with people hosting online events is what's gonna differentiate us? Um, I think that's the biggest question I had to ask myself and it's taken some time to really figure out how we're gonna segment that. Um, and so, everyone's talking about unbundling. And so unbundling is really like a, a hyper focus on more niche prospects and titles. So for instance, you have a yoga class, instead of it being a yoga class, it's a moon yoga class or an evening yoga class. People are tending to search for things that are really specific 
and then growing the community off of that versus being just a yoga class. Listen, there's a million yoga classes that are being hosted online right now. And unfortunately, there's nothing that's going to differentiate you from anyone else that's hosting at that point in time. So it's, it's basically like, how are you going to verbally online distinguish yourself? And so I think the key in Society X is these hyper niche creatives and their hyper niche topics that attract this really organic community and then just growing from there. So I think that's a really important point that I've learned over the past eight months. I love that. And I, I feel like the data is so grounded because, you know, anecdotally, uh, Jocelyn will have these really specific class because obviously houseplants are a big thing right now, but she had one that was about houseplants and kids or houseplants and pets um, and these really hyper specific topics that like I want to know more about and a quick Google search is not going to satisfy that. Um, so I, I adore that. But I'm actually I'm going to stop presenting so that we can um, dive into some of this discussion now. So you, you, you kind of highlighted on this, but if we, if we dive a little bit deeper, um, what made you pivot to online events versus just waiting until things could reopen? That's a good question. <laughs> um, listen, I love hosting real-time events. It's, it's been just an incredibly exciting time for me when it comes to that, being able to host Art Basel. This past year, we were brought into Short Club Hotel um, as their as their event manager and bringing all the creatives and artists in the physical space, which was an absolute honor. It, it was a big deal. Um, and that's something that I, I would never want to throw to the side. But what I've realized is that by hosting virtual events, it's not that the internet hasn't ever existed, it has. It's the fact that people are now finding that they can find their tribe online and they can be anywhere in the world to do so. And I feel like the net is just cast so much wider and the opportunity is really there across the board. So I think people on the price price point, you know, page, which is why we're here talking about this, are still a little hesitant. Listen, our world is going through a big shift, so it's something that we're all trying to figure out. Um, but I think transferring to the digital space uh, as an entrepreneur not only gives me a little bit of wiggle room to not have to worry about overhead costs, which are as a creator and as a physical event manager, very expensive and nerve wracking. Um, it's given me some wiggle room to kind of figure it out and also connect with people that I probably would never have met before. Um, and I'm super thankful for that. And I actually think that it's, um, it's an incredible opportunity right now. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of folks like we saw the girls in tech community, they're, they're discovering a lot of areas that they couldn't explore when they were managing in person events, um, and they're able to actually test them out in a scalable way right now. So it is definitely, it's a really difficult time to be an event creator, but it's an exciting time to learn new things. Um, Obviously, this is, I'm biased, and so I love Eventbrite, um, but there's a million different products that one can use when they're hosting their online events and they're um, collecting tickets and registrations. What drove you towards Eventbrite, and what are some of the things that have been really helpful on the product uh, as you have grown Society X online? Yeah, absolutely. Well, on the physical side, Eventbrite was just the easiest solution for us as we opened up our physical spaces in New York. I didn't want to have to really ask and go searching for like what the next best thing would be. I mean, Eventbrite's kind of been around for many, many years. So that's been just a helpful solution. And then as we transferred to digital, it was just the product that we were using. Uh, and also similar to like Facebook or larger companies like that, it's also a brand name that I think people are comfortable with and people go to as a resource. So that's, that's why we chose to utilize the platform. Amazing. Uh, and so you have a lot of different events. How are you and also the creators that are in Society X thinking about pricing and uh, how, how are they, what pricing are they landed on now? And have there been any shifts and changes based on feedback from their attendees? Yeah, when we first started Society X, we were free. Um, and it wasn't until May that we started integrating pricing into our classes. I think we were trying, I think everyone was trying to figure out like how much longer is this going for? Um, and then also the next biggest question was, are people willing to pay? I think that there's been a lot of Zoom burnout um, and people were just like, I've literally been bombarded on Instagram and Zoom with fitness classes and everything else. Like how much more could there be? Um, and so we started small. We started at five to $10 with our most expensive one-on-one -on -one being about 20. Um, and now we're kind of shifting to $10 and up. Um, I still think it's an interesting time because we're trying to scope out exactly 
um, what people are willing to pay you know, across the world at this point. Um, and I think that has to do obviously with our financial markets and that's a different conversation. Um, but you know, I think the other aspect of it is our free classes are gaining such momentum. We have so many people in, in those classes. How can we continue to pay our creators and continue to have the content when they can free? So that's one of the biggest questions that I have right now that I'm trying to solve. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I'm really looking forward to either figuring out a subscription base on a corporate level for corporate sponsorships in that capacity. Um, because listen, creators need to be compensated for their time um, and this amazing content they're putting out. And um, yeah, so I still think on the actual class side, anything under $20 is a great way to be. Um, we used to see classes over $30 and it would just prove that there's something, I don't know, of substance there. And that doesn't exist anymore. I think people need to be able to afford to come to class every week. And if that's like a $10 class and that's them paying $40 a month and that's totally reasonable, so. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, you touched on a whole bunch of pro tips and you've been doing this you know, since COVID hit and have had a couple of different iterations of how you're pricing and how you're structuring and how you're listing things. Um, what are some like pro tips that you would share to an event creator who's just starting to host online events? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I, I would say as a pro tip would be the unbundling aspect. Um, just think of yourself looking for an event. I mean, you're just going to sift through so many things. So it goes back to the original point of how are you going to distinguish yourself from everybody else? Um, the number two thing is not to get frustrated. I think, you know, we have a few new hosts starting with us this week. Everyone's like, well, is that enough people signing up? Wait wait and see how it goes. Give it a week or two to see if your topic is really picking up um, and then really drill down to like what the hyper focus is. I know you mentioned earlier, surveying or asking questions of your community is a really great place to start. People love to give feedback, whether you wanna accept it or not. <laughs> it's a really good place to ask questions. So go for it and do that. Um, and then I think when it comes to pricing, um, on a pro tip level, if you're finding that people love your free classes, that's fine. Look at podcasts, for instance. Podcasts are free, and Joe Rogan is now getting paid, what, $18 million to be on Spotify, and he provides a free service. So your free service is worthwhile if you're getting a very large amount of users, and there's something that you can do with that. And so I guess the question is, what can you do to continue to, you know, pay yourself or your creators, and then also let this continue to be free? So. It can be sponsorships. Um, I think that we're going to see a shift similar to podcasts on the web, you know, webinar platform as well. Um, and then I would also say, you know, how can you make it a subscription base for like corporate companies or larger partnerships in that capacity? So people can still get something for free and then you can have money to pay your creators as well. I love that. That's really amazing pro tips. And I know that you've been through all of this sort of a, a trial by fire. So uh, <laughs> I think that your, your insight is so great. Um, this is sort of related, but what are, what's like one of the biggest challenges that you faced in uh, keeping these online events going? Um, exactly the question that was earlier is I think, listen, it's, there's just so much content out there and it's not only on the webinar base, it's Instagram, it's Facebook Live, it's YouTube Live, it's everything. There's just so much. So I think finding a way to distinguish yourself, number one, has been difficult. And then number two, it's like, how do you carry over and, and, and make people either make a purchase for something that they really enjoy or try to find out, find other ways to continue to you know, pay your creators so the content can remain free. And I think, I think that's the biggest question. And I don't know if all of us have the answer yet because we're, we've only been in this for eight months, um, but it's going to be really interesting to see kind of what happens from there. I mean, there's been other avenues of uh, brands like podcasts that have been able to figure out the free freemium situation. And uh, I think now we're just in the new world. And so whoever figures it out first, like go for it. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. And I my touch is sort of on my next question, which is, um, you know, there's some news of a vaccine and all of us are sort of waiting to see how things play out. But um, in the undetermined timeline future, when people are able to start gathering safely in real life, um, how do you think Society X will approach it? Will you switch fully to in real life? Will you keep doing a hybrid model? Are you going to stay online? What are your thoughts? So... It pains me to think, I mean, listen, I would love to go to one of my own parties right now, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but I I am really enjoying kind of being on the back end of things and just kind of running the show and meeting incredible creators all over the world. So I think for me, we're gonna stay digital. I, I think, you know, people have found their tribes and they've found their communities and they've connected in ways I've never seen before. And I would always, you know, that's pretty much been my dream. Um, and so I'm going to continue riding this wave and we're going to stay digital. Wow, that's exciting. I think, you know, one of the questions I had in our, our Q&A list was like, what's one of the biggest surprises? And I feel like you've touched on a couple of them. But one is that like, yeah, people when at first we were like at the sense of loss because people we thought people couldn't connect like they've connected in ways that we never imagined and for me that's been a huge surprise to watch um how how truly meaningful uh an online event can be and then how you can accidentally discover these new connections and new communities and new friends that you didn't really have access to before yeah and i think also it's a support system um right now you know london's in a lockdown and we've been getting some incredible messages from people like i go to all your classes so thankful for you know, Sarah, I know you're watching right now our therapeutic art class or, you know, our poetry workshop, um, just getting people through the day. I mean, it's, it's really tough. And so I think the wellness aspect, you know, being a previous athlete for me, is I always considered wellness to be on the fitness side. And what we're also realizing that we can bring to people is that wellness encompasses many more things. It encompasses art and poetry and attending a, you know, making a home for houseplants class. And, and the fact that we can give this to people is, uh, is incredible and and that's not something I'm I want to change or go back to. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that so much. Um we're getting some great any other like final thoughts and then we have we have a couple pre-submitted QA and then we're getting a couple of um fun submissions and Jacqueline we can keep you on board because I think some of these things you can jump in and answer for our our other creators as well. Any other final thoughts that you want to share? Um yeah check our classes out. I'm gonna give yeah. us <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you can go to www.thesocietyx.com, um, check us out, and also host with us if you're interested. I uh, obviously love the collaboration with Eventbrite, like super thankful to be able to have this conversation and be on your platform. And yeah, keep watching us. We have some really exciting things in the works. And uh, yeah, that's it. What other questions can I answer? I'm, I'm here to help. I'm in the same boat. So. Yeah, I was going to say, I think there's one that we actually touched on, and then we, we had a few submissions, which is that... Uh, someone asked, I get a ton of registrations when I offer my events for free and I get a lot less when I do only a donation option instead. What do I do? Um, I, you know, I think a lot of creators think that they have to choose between making any money and having registrations. And um, what I would say is that we've seen a lot of creators get really creative and offer both. Uh, so it's kind of the por Nolos dose situation where um, go ahead and offer that free registration. Give people a way to sign up. Um, maybe it's a half-hearted commitment, but it, it indicates some kind of interest. Maybe they have absolutely no money, but they're dying to come to your class. Uh, and then offer that donation option for people that have funds. A lot of people are calling it like the sliding scale ticket or no one turned away for lack of funds ticket. Um, so that way people, if they have five bucks to spare, they can throw it at you. If they are gainfully employed and they can offer your normal rate of $20, you can say suggested donation is 20. Um, but that way you're not losing out on the, op on the option to register for free. Uh, and in addition to that, I would say use the free registration and donation along with an add-on option because upselling um, a valuable item to people who have the funds and they want to, to go that extra mile is a great way not to put pressure on the people who can't do that. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're testing right now as well, just going off of that. I mean, I, I, we're in the same boat. Um, and so we, instead of doing just the donation key, because I saw the same issue, it's like we had all these people signing up for this free class, and then we added a donation. And it was like, okay, so we had all these signups last week. We added a donation key, and we like literally lost viewers. So I like the option of having free and donation. And we're also doing the add on all together. So, like, now people have three options. You know, I feel like people like options, so give it to them. And 
listen, users and viewers are gold. So you don't want to lose your audience in the meantime. And if you can continue to build that, uh, do so. So I, I totally agree with you on that. I love that advice. Um, uh, we got a little follow up question in the Q&A, which is how do you do that? So earlier in the deck, we showed that my ticket section. And if you just create a ticket, you can add like a free one. And then you click that orange button again, and you can have multiple tickets. So there's really no limit. I mean, don't go crazy and add a 1000 tickets. I think that might be over, over the top. Um, but you can add a couple of different options there for attendees. And you can also do things like an early bird ticket, someone asked about, you know, gated access. So if you do want to have a less expensive price to draw drive pre-registrations, you can have it be $5. And in the advanced settings, you can change it so that uh, that ticket um, closes down at a certain date and then, it re and then it opens up your next ticket, which is like the regular price. You can also have VIP that maybe has additional add-ons. Um, you can get really creative with how you do ticketing. And like, like we mentioned earlier, don't be afraid to experiment. If what you're doing isn't working, change it for the next event and see if it's any better. Uh, and also change the name. I know it sounds ridiculous, but change the name of your event. Instead of like I was speaking to you earlier, if there's like a yoga class, make it more direct. Like for instance, we had an evening moon, uh, an evening yoga class. Now it's evening moon yoga. Like it just, just try a few iterations and see what attracts people. That also could be a, a good solution. Yeah, we actually had a question submitted that says, uh, any tips on naming your event so that it attracts your ideal attendee? Uh, and I think that's just it. I think you want to be specific. Uh, like like Jacqueline mentioned, there's a, a million yoga classes out there online. But what is it about the yoga class that you're offering? And I use yoga as an example. You could replace it with anything um, mm -hmm. that's different than the, you know, the other 10 happening on the same day. And that way you can attract, it's not just the ideal attendee, it's like attracting the people who want to, to, to come to what you're doing specifically. Um, let's see. A really specific question here is that someone, when they asked about quantity, so uh, I'm trying to add their book as an add-on for an upcoming event. What is Eventbrite looking for when you ask for quantity? So that means how many books you have? <laughs> um, what is the quantity available? So if you only have 100 books, you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna cap the add-on orders at 100 so that you don't oversell and run out of inventory. Uh, and that's the same for tickets as well. Um, someone earlier asked about what's the ideal class size? And for that, I would say, you know, it all depends on the class. You wanna, you wanna limit the class to um, whatever feels right for the group that you're doing. If it's a small intimate conversation and people are talking to each other, you probably don't wanna have a Zoom call with 50 or 100 people on it. Um, but if it's really about the numbers, so if you're just streaming a music show, you want that to be unlimited and to have as many people come in as possible. Um, so there, I wouldn't say there's really a single answer to what's the ideal class size. It depends on what you're doing and it depends on your goals. Um, so if you're trying to engage a really a uh, highly engaged small group of people that kind of gives you the answer there and if you're just you want the whole world to know about what you're doing the whole world to tune into your event sky is the limit um, I want to do a quick touch on the pre-submitted questions uh, so we get to these we had a question where someone asked is it better to pass fees along to attendees or to absorb them I don't know which setting to choose here um, so for anyone new to the product, when you are creating tickets under the settings option, you can either uh, pass the fees along to the attendee. So if you have a $5 ticket and there's a 50 cent fee, that would mean that the attendee pays $5.50. Um, if you absorb the fee, that means the attendee pays the flat $5 and then you get the net proceeds of $4.50. I think also this is another really personal option. Um, some people like the numbers to be nice and round so that your attendees see the price and that's what they pay. Other people feel very comfortable with an additional fee. I think a lot of us as consumers um, are used to going and buying a concert ticket and seeing an additional fee on there. Um, not even concert tickets. It's like, you know, ordering food online these days. There's like three extra fees and I don't always know entirely what they're for, but it's it's part of the process. Um, and so it depends on what you're doing. And then I would also say, like, if this is a charity event or if um, your your particular audience, you know, is very short on funds, maybe you're you're supporting marginalized communities, um, you might want to go ahead and absorb the fees so that's not carried over to your attendees. Um, and like I mentioned, the donation option does not have Eventbrite fees associated with it. So that's a great option um, if you're raising money for a good cause or if you're supporting a community that is marginalized and you want to uh, allow them to pay anything and not have that added fee. There you go. It's perfect. What do I do if no one is showing up to my online events? <laughs> 
yes, please go ahead. How did you handle that? Listen, it's tough, right? Because I think for our paid, our free classes, people are always showing up. But then when it comes to the paid classes, it's kind of, it's your own choice. However, I will give this pro tip as well. This is content that you're putting out and that you're readily able to do. So would you think about maybe making a podcast out of this content when you're done with it and maybe figuring out another stream of revenue for yourself? So don't be stuck in just thinking this class can just be this webinar and that's it. There's places you can put it like YouTube or you can also, once you're done with it, download it and make it into an MP3 and then just go to Buzzsprout and for free, you can now have your own podcast series. So there's a lot of other ways to kind of start building your community um, just from that one single video. So think of other I love that. It's so true. And what I would say from like the Eventbrite side is that we have a ton of great promotional tools. You know, obviously there there's a million ways to collect registrations for events. Um, you can even just put it live on your Instagram live and allow anyone to tune in. But if you are using a system like Eventbrite, um, we have these built-in promotional tools. So you can retarget previous attendees, make sure that they know that classes are coming up. Um, there's paid social ad options within Eventbrite. Uh, and um, we have an email campaign tool where you can upload, uh, you know, maybe you have a bunch of people who subscribe to your newsletter. You can add that into Eventbrite and make sure that you're reaching out to a really broad audience every time that you host an event. And then my other advice would be like, don't give up and stay consistent. When we were talking to Vito from TOF Productions, who we highlighted earlier, he, he had some good advice, which you can find on the blog, where he basically said, um, I don't want to mince his words here. He was like, it takes a while to get your footing and it takes a while to build an audience so you might not have anyone at your first you know first couple of events first dozen events um, but if you keep going and you keep uh looking at your performance and trying to find that really uh you know spot on audience for what you're doing um it will grow with time so it's not going to be probably an overnight success and if it is let us know and we want to know how you did it <laughs> um so I'm so happy that you are all submitting questions. We got through our, our small handful of pre-submitted questions and we have a bunch of live ones. I'm gonna go ahead and try to tackle a couple based on some of the themes that I'm seeing. Um, but for everything that we don't get through, we'll try to send information in the follow-up email. And to answer a question that we saw here, yes, we are gonna be recording this. It will be available on the Eventbrite YouTube channel. Um, if you are a YouTuber, I would say slide over there and subscribe to the channel. We have a ton of great videos. We have all the webinars up there. We did one a couple of weeks ago with Craft Jam on our new um, Zoom integration. Uh, and there's just so much information. So it'll be available. No sweat if you tuned in late or you have to duck out early. All right, we have a couple. Let me, I'm going to try to tackle these. One question here is what's the benefit of doing it live versus sharing out recordings? And I think right now is a perfect example of why it's so useful to do these uh, live events because you really get to interact with people. So if someone, you know, all of you lovely human beings who are dialed in, you can ask live questions and get information in real time versus combing through multiple recordings trying to find an answer to your question. Um, let's see. Can I actually tag on that for one yeah, second? Please. Yes. I think the other great thing about being live is you can give people action items. And so what's going to distinguish your webinar from another one is the action item, right? So you want people to do something or comment on something in real time. If they're just watching it, they can leave at any time. There's no reason for them to come back. So having an actionable item during your webcast is super important to kind of maintaining your community or growing it. Yeah, I love that. And I think it sort of relates to that. Um, some of the events that are using the add on item to mail out merchandise in advance, there's something really uh, wonderful about having like a, that extra involvement where it's not just you watching a screen, there's either an action item where you're actively doing something or you're like actively uh, engaging with a tangible item. So again, it all relates because that's a, you know, a way to differentiate yourself. Um, let's see. Have any of our creators had success with tiered, Tracy asked this, tiered or time-limited ticket pricing? Um, yes, absolutely. So, you know, 
before COVID, uh, we were seeing this in ticket buyer habits and it's the same thing afterwards. If you have uh, an early bird sale that ends at a certain date, it's gonna definitely drive ticket buyers to commit earlier and potentially at a slightly higher price point than they would otherwise if they didn't feel like it was gonna expire. Um, I think it sort of taps into that like on sale mentality that a lot of humans have where you are on the fence about a purchase and like, oh, it's on sale. Well, I got to buy it. Um, I don't have data to support that, but I think that is uh, something, a trend that we see a lot. What are your thoughts on regularly scheduled re recurring digital events versus spontaneous pop-up events? Is there a benefit or disadvantage to either in your opinion? Um, I think it depends on your audience and the kind of event that you're hosting. As Jacqueline mentioned, there is a, there's so many events happening and there's a really big saturation that I think one of the risks of a pop-up is that you don't have a ton of time to um, create a little bit of buzz and get buy-in and make sure that people are free um, so they can actually tune into your event. Um, certainly, I have had the experience where I am you know, looking for something to do after I put my kids to bed and I happen to see that one of my friends is streaming music on Facebook and I tune in and it's delightful. But I'd say for me personally, that's the exception and not the rule. Um, so I think that a recurring or scheduled event would give you a little bit more muscle in terms of promotion. Uh, Jacqueline, do you have like any insight as in your own personal experience about that topic? Yeah, I mean, we've been running our events weekly, um, like, till who knows when. <laughs> um, and I think it's great because there's been some events that really were slow to pick up and now they're booming. I mean, so you just really have to give it time. Um, and I think also it gives people time to find you, which is also, you know, it's tough. I mean, you can maybe change the name of your event, like I mentioned earlier, um, a few times to see what works. And that, that takes, that takes a, like all of a sudden 30 days are gone and that's been a month. So just give yourself a little bit of breathing room. I mean, that's worked for us. Um, a little bit more specifically, I know we have four minutes of trying to get through as many of these as I can. Mary asked about how payouts work for Eventbrite. So for any of my new uh, friends who are dialing in, learning about Eventbrite for the first time and thinking about hosting your first paid event. Um, so when you do a paid event on Eventbrite and you're using the Eventbrite payment processor, yes, the funds can get uh, deposited directly into your account. So as you click out, click into your payout options, you'll be able to enter your bank information and it will be sent directly and electronically. Um, again, like I mentioned, I host events personally outside of Eventbrite and I, I love seeing those deposits. Uh, it's always a great feeling. Um, a lot of people have been asked to, like how much did you reduce things based on a, an in-person event versus free? Um, again, it's anecdotal, but uh, on the blog, if you look at some of our creator stories, a lot of people said that they have their costs. So whatever they were charging, they did half. Um, part of it is because people have less funds. Um, there is, uh, you know, there is a huge availability of online events. And then also as creators, we have less overhead. So we do have the ability to scale back a little bit on how much we're charging. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, every event is going to uh, warrant a different price for a different reason. Um, someone asked about, are we going to cover different event prices for different categories of events? We covered a couple earlier and someone asked specifically about um, continuing education and professional development. So the, the professional development classes would probably fall into that higher price point that we looked at earlier. That was around, I'm not going to remember this off the top of my head. So I'm going to look at the data here. I had it right here. Um, so just a quick recap for anyone that dialed in late. The average online ticket prices by category that we've seen in the industry are about $17 for a music event, $29 is the average price for an online wellness event, and this is average. So, you know, we're incorporating all of our $5, $10 classes and then these really um, high tailored experiences that can be up to 100. Um, food and Bev classes tend to be around uh, $34 and uh, science and technology events tend to be around 87 and business and professional tickets are one of the highest averages that we see sitting around $91 average. So every event is going to be different and even things within those, those are averages. So don't think that just because you're doing a um, music event, you have to charge exactly $17. That might not be the right solution for you. And then a few people asked if we could send some follow-up information on the promotional tools that we mentioned, as well as uh, a little bit more information on how to add these tickets and how to add multiples. So we will include information about that in our uh, recap email. And I'm gonna see. All right. 
a few people have said that we're doing a great job. Thank you. That's so kind of you. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, and then it looks like a few people had uh, some questions about your podcast topic, Jacqueline. So um, maybe is how would you feel about people reaching out to you directly? Is there any way that people can contact you? Yeah, absolutely. You guys can reach me either on LinkedIn, it's Jacqueline Rosenberg, or you can reach me on email at info at the Society X. I'm happy to answer any questions or help guide you through some strategies that I've been learning along the way to save you guys some time. So feel free to ask away. Uh, once again, it's info at the society x.com. So thanks. that's awesome. Yeah. And I, I would say just kind of a closing thought here. First of all, Jacqueline, thank you so much for dialing in. One of the uh, most joyful parts of what's been happening is the ability for me and you to connect when, you know, there, that might not have happened. And in a broader sense, we're seeing a lot of creators band together and create a sense of community because we are all in this new world together and we're all figuring it out and we're stuck at home so we can talk online. So thank you so much for, for joining this Eventbrite community and for tuning in to everybody who's on the call uh, and anybody who's watching this at a later date on the YouTube webinar. Um, we're so happy to have you and we love to stay connected. Um, we do uh, bi-weekly interviews uh, with other creators on our Eventbrite Instagram. So you can go to the Eventbrite Instagram and give us a follow. And every other Friday, we go live with a creator for behind the scenes. And it's a great way to see what other people are doing and connect with awesome people like Jacqueline. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, go ahead and uh, follow the YouTube channel for more information and more webinars like this. And we'll send a follow-up email and have a, a survey feedback form where you can let us know um, if there's anything you want to learn more about uh, or if you have any thoughts for future topics. And with that, we are perfectly at three o'clock. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Jacqueline. And uh, thank you to all future viewers. I hope that everybody has a great day. Thanks. Have a good one, guys. Bye.